Okay. Uh, our talk's called uh, It's a Hard Knock Life, and it's a little bit about um, kind of what it's like to be an Android developer, um, what are things like today, and kind of how we wish things could be in the future. So, um, my name is Michael Galpin. I work for uh, Bump Technologies. Um, for Bump, I worked at eBay. Uh, both places I worked on are Android applications, so I've been fortunate enough to work on two of the more popular uh, Android apps out there. Uh, I'm also a co-author of Android in Practice, which is a book that got published about a month ago. Um, it's a book meant for uh, sort of an advanced Android development book, so if you're into writing Android and that's what you do for a living, I highly uh, recommend it, of course. And, uh, my name is Jonathan Simon. Um, I've also worked for several large and small companies. Right now I work for a company called Alltrails, which is, uh, even though I hate the this for that analogy, we're kind of like a Yelp for the outdoors. So we do listing of uh, hiking, mountain biking trails and sort of let you find things in the outdoors. Um, I'm also the author of Head First Android Development, which should be coming out relatively soon. I'll keep you guys posted on how that goes. So um, just a little bit about why we're here. Um, we've experienced all of these different issues being Android developers, authors, and working at startups. So we wanted to sort of take the world and, you know, lots of people talk about what everything is going on in the Android community and, and all the different issues, but we kind of wanted to bring it back down to a realistic personal experience and let you know what we've experienced personally. And as far as why we're doing this, it's because the users and the developers and all the people in the ecosystem of the Android ecosystem are being harmed by this. And we actually don't like that and we want to fix it. So what we want to do again is just sort of bring these, these stories that we've experienced and that we know people who've also experienced and sort of share them with you and hopefully we'll get to somewhere where this gets fixed. And so just a couple of these stories. Okay, uh, first up we wanted to address designers. Uh, so I don't know how many, if we have any designers here in the, oh, one guy, okay. If you ask for something like this, um, basically if you ask for an iPhone app on Android, right? That's uh, that's not going to happen, right? That is um, Android is a different platform. You should not try to recreate an iPhone app on Android. Um, but unfortunately, there are apps out there like this, right? So these are all examples of what I call iPhoney apps. Um, so that's a uh, Soundhound on the on the left, uh, Pulse, which is a great app. Um, Words with Friends, uh, Square. A lot of these are great apps that are you know, really useful, but they're all iPhone-y, right? They all look like iPhone apps. They have the name of the app in the middle. Maybe they have a, a, a back button on the screen. Um, you know, they have these extremely rounded corner buttons. You know, these don't look like Android apps, right? There is no need to have a back button in your app if it's an Android app. Every Android phone has a has its own back button that users are used to using. You know, so you're just insulting them by putting something on the screen that they're not going to use anyways, right? So, so don't don't make apps like this. Don't ask for apps like this. Um, there's no such thing as a port, right? It's a it's a different platform has different UI paradigms. Um, you know, trying to port things, all you'll do is make a, a poor imitation at best. Um, and at worst, you're just going to insult the user and give them something that's hard for them to use, right? So if you're going to design for Android, learn Android, you know, embrace the platform, right? So that might mean, you know, giving up your precious iPhone for a while and actually using an Android device. Um, I'm sure you can survive and get over it, but that's what you really need to do. All right. So next, we kind of wanted to talk about device manufacturers. Anybody in here build devices? Okay, cool. So I can talk freely. All right. So this is actually my phone. Um, I use the HTC Thunderbolt, the Verizon phone. I actually really like it. There's a lot I do like about it. It's got this kind of kickstand, which seems kind of goofy at first, but actually daily, I actually kind of like it. Here's the problem though. The USB cord's at the bottom, right? So if you're, you know, you can, you can rest the, the phone on its side and it rests there, but you actually can't charge it while it's resting. Now I'm sure there's some kind of reason, you know, maybe they built a dock or something, but the hardware guys thought it made sense to do this. But from a daily practical usage standpoint, it really sucks. And it's not like it, it doesn't fundamentally alter your experience so that you can't use the phone, but it's one of these things where you just look at it and you're like, man, that was a goofy decision. And so, you know, we're trying to avoid all these like iOS versus Android comparisons, but 
frankly, like the, the, the little fruit stand company in Cupertino would not do something like this. And so, you know, we as members of the device community, we also can't do this. So hardware is part of it, right? But um, one of the cool things about Android is that it's all open source. So if you're going to manufacture a device, you can get all the source code and then you can change it. And you can do lots of things. Maybe you can add stuff to it. Um, and then whatever you do, you can put it on your device. So that sounds really good in principle. But there's a lot of things within Android that are uh, the, the OS offers up APIs that the actual manufacturers have to implement. Right? So some examples of this is the camera. Another example of this is contacts, the address book on the phone. Um, and then even more hardware things like accelerometers and, and whatnot. So if you do these things poorly, uh, it makes, it makes a, my life very difficult as a developer. Right? So I, I singled out HTC here because they have a um, kind of a checkered past here of you know, not really holding to the contracts of Android. Right? So um, if you use a HTC phone um, and it's a, if an app uses the camera app on the HTC phone, the way that it stores the, the picture it saves is non-standard. It's not like how all the other you know, devices out there do it. The HTC ones do it a little bit different, you know, and that may seem okay. Okay, well, I can deal with everybody else and HTC, but obviously if, if uh, every device maker does this, it doesn't uh, bode well for developers. Yeah, so we don't want to just rag on HTC, right? Um, so this is the Motorola Droid Pro, if I'm not mistaken. My wife had this phone. It was her first Android phone. Um, it was kind of cool. It had a, you know, hardware keyboard. It looked like it was doing kind of good things. Um, the only issue is that it's using Motoblur, which is uh, a forked entire version of Android. And it had some pretty serious bugs, especially on this particular device, to where, you know, turning off the alarm in the morning would actually crash the phone. Little things like this, which are actually a huge deal. So, you know, getting back to the overall points, um, no goofy hardware, right? So like the HTC um, little kickstand thing, if you're going to put plugs in places, whatever you're doing with the hardware, make sure it's, it's decent. Uh, as Michael was saying, make sure the API behavior is consistent because, again, what's going to happen if it's not is that someone's going to have a Nexus One or you know whatever droid they have. They're going to test it. They're going to think their app works. They're going to put it out in the market, and it's going to crash. So it gives kind of everybody in the whole Android ecosystem a bad experience. The users are upset. You're upset because you're getting bad reviews. You know, everybody loses. Um, and you know, as far as you know, the the Moto Blur and the HTC Sense and all this other kind of stuff. Preferably, I think most of the people that I know um, would prefer Android not be forked. Google spends a lot of time trying to make sure that the OS user experience is, is pretty good. And if it's going to be improved, it should be improved for everybody. Um, I think we're all going to buy good hardware if the hardware is good. It doesn't need to have a custom version of Android. And especially if you do fork, don't introduce bugs and make sure that the actual fork works. So this is actually kind of a big problem that I hope does get fixed. Yeah, so kind of the, the partners in crime for the device manufacturers are carriers, right? So carriers, um, they don't just uh, sell the phones for the device makers. They actually are able to customize them quite a bit themselves. And I remember when the um, HTC Evo came out, um, I guess about a year and a half ago now, and I opened up the phone, and this is what I saw, right? This is the, the app drawer. And there are all these apps on here like this uh, Sprint Navigation, Sprint TV, Sprint Zone. Um, there was a, an NFL app on here. There was a NASCAR app on here. Um, I thought, well, these are silly. But OK, so Sprint, they wanted to give me some extra stuff for free. How nice of them. But I don't really, I'm not a NASCAR fan personally. Maybe I'll just go and uninstall. Um, but no, that didn't work. Um, the apps could not be removed. And this is not just Sprint. This is from a Verizon phone, right? And, you know, they put Blockbuster apps, all kinds of, you know, Verizon stuff on here. And you can't uninstall any of these things, right? So they just take up all the space in your device, you know, and they may not do anything you even care about at all. And then you can't even uninstall them. Um, right, so just don't do this, right? You know, don't, don't put crap on phones that nobody wants. Or if you're going to do it, uh, let people remove stuff. Um, fortunately, uh, Google actually has addressed this recently. 
you know, they announced uh, last week as part of Ice Cream Sandwich that um, you can disable any app on your phone. So even if the carriers put an app on there that you can't uninstall, you can neuter it essentially, make it where it can't do anything. It can't, and particularly, it can't launch in the background and you know download things. You know, anticipating you're going to want to find out about the, the latest NASCAR race. Um, so that kind of helps. You know, at, at least uh, you know it mitigates the problem slightly. But um, but this is really a, a bad experience for users to even do this at all, right? <laughs> And some of the some of the manufacturers have gotten better about this. Um, Sprint, in particular, uh, later on released an update to the Evo where you could remove all the Sprint apps. Also, uh, don't put lockdown on devices, right? So, you know, in some cases, um, you know, AT and T had a lot of devices out for a while where they would not allow third-party apps to be installed, right? So that made, for example, people could not put the the um, Amazon App Store on their phone. So, you know, don't do that. People choose Android for a reason, right? It's an open platform. Doing things like locking down the device, you know, is just completely against the whole idea of Android, right? And then, obviously, these guys um, control the operating system updates, right? So, one of the great things about Android is that um, OS updates come over the air. You know, there's no need to plug it into your computer and download something to your computer or run any software in your computer. You know, you get an update over the air, you know, you click a button and, you know, a few minutes later it's installed and your phone's restarted and got a new version of the OS. Um, but because it comes over the air, we have to rely on the carriers to get these updates out in a timely manner. So. Yeah, so I got to kind of tread lightly here because I do enjoy my job and I want to continue to work in the area. So, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this. I'll tread lightly. But, you know, Google... It's, they're not the only player here. That's why we didn't talk about them first. Um, you know, everybody is involved in this big ecosystem we keep talking about. But I do want to talk about a few things that I think Google could help out with. So this is a, this is a support email I got about two weeks ago. Um, somebody was having issues. They uninstalled the app and couldn't reinstall. So this is addressing the issues with the actual Android market itself. Not all the different Android markets. That's kind of a whole other issue. But this is just saying specifically the market itself has to work. So, it, you know, the APKs, the, the Android packages get downloaded, they get versioned um, based on the order that they were downloaded, and then they get installed. So something obviously on this person's phone didn't work. So it's unsure if it was, you know, part of a, a bug in the actual market app or something was wrong with the device. But regardless, the, the, the process of installing um, an app onto a device has to be absolutely flawless. I mean, if this breaks, it's the first experience that they're having with an app. Everybody looks bad. Um, another thing I wanted to sort of bring up is this whole issue with patents. I mean, obviously this is in the news all the time. This is a little bit of a chart just talking about who is in debt to who with what patents. I'm sure you guys have seen this or versions of it before, but I just want to highlight it here in that this just needs to be solved. I mean, the, the fact that there are all these patent issues anyway is kind of ridiculous. Um, and actually to highlight the ridiculousness, take a look at this guy. Um, so we all know about all the patent issues that are going on. People are worried, engineers that I talk to, younger engineers are worried about being involved in Android development because they don't know where the future of the platform is going related to these patents. They're worried that um, you know, Google's gonna lose a number of patent lawsuits and all of a sudden Android as a, as a platform isn't going to exist. So right now, actually, and this goes beyond Android, I actually think the entire mobile market is suffering because of this, um, this fight that we have over software patents that's just a little bit getting kind of ridiculous. So I'd like to just see this resolved and we can all kind of get past it. Now, this is another um, chart you guys may have seen on the tubes going around today and, and yesterday. This is a chart talking about um, the, the version updates per devices and the supported update versions of the OS on the different devices. Um, it's a little bit extreme, but what you're seeing by all the green on top is, is the um, iOS devices supporting the latest um, versions of the iOS operating system. And down below, you're seeing a lot of less green on the Android side in that Android devices aren't supporting the latest versions of, of and, well, the devices aren't supporting the latest version of Android. Now, it, the reason I'm saying it's a little bit skewed is a number of the devices on the bottom of this chart um, are actually little used devices. Um, there's like the, the Motorola Click and, you know, the Backflip and some other devices that just didn't work like the Garmin phone, who no one actually uses. So it's, it's a little bit skewed, but I think it does highlight the point that um, we do actually need to, um, make sure that the, the later devices or the later versions of the operator is supported on as many devices as possible. 
Yeah, and as a developer, you know, uh, this is not the chart I look at, right? I have a chart at work that shows um, what versions of Android our users are using, right? So that's a that's a similar kind of data, but it's a different way to to look at it, right? So as Jonathan mentioned, you know, some of the uh, devices listed on here didn't sell much at all, right? And you know, Android being a free market, um, you know, if you're Motorola, you introduce a device doesn't sell at all you know do you bother investing into updates for that device probably not right but if you have a device that does sell really well like the droid you know or on here's the the evo uh, then yeah you're going to invest in those so you know for uh from a developer's perspective what you see then is okay you know this percentage of my users are on this version of the os this percentage are on this other version of the os right and it actually breaks down pretty nicely like if i compare this with my uh, iPhone developing brothers at Bump, um, they have about a, a pretty similar situation that they're in of what, what versions of the OS they have to support. But it's still uh, very critical for you know, devices to get new versions of the OS, right? That allows you know, developers to move forward with new features in the platform. Um, and again, this is something that Google is, you know, is trying to address. They, they made a statement at Google I.O. this year that you know, any um, you know, any new devices are going to get um, updates for 18 months, right? So that'd make it for a lot more green on there. But again, it all depends on what devices you, you choose there. So just um, in summary, the, the market's got to be really solid, right? We had, a, we had a case at Bump where we did an update to Bump, and if you looked on the Android market through your web browser, it did not show the update. If you looked on it through your phone, it did show the update. But still, that was pretty frustrating. And we, we went several days where we didn't see the update there on the, on the Android market. You know, so um, the Android market is, you know, basically your marketing arm of your company, right? It's where people first see about your app, read about your app. You know, so it's got to be really reliable or otherwise it's going to be really hard for you to reach customers. So, um, so that's got to work really well. And you know, the whole patent wars business, um, that's got to get resolved, you know, to, to really let, you know, really get that out of the way for developers. So speaking of uh, developers, um, so I think we probably have a few developers in the room as well, right? Yeah. Okay. You have to be ashamed. We're all friends here. Yeah. Right. So, um, I want to talk about you know some of the some of the patterns we've seen in uh, amongst developers that kind of dis disturbs us, right? Um, you know, we we get a lot of developers who apply for jobs and they say, oh, I've got all these these apps I've written and they're on the market and they think they're really badass because of that, right? But you know, the apps actually kind of suck, you know, and it's really easy to just create an app and get it out there, but it doesn't mean it's any good, you know. I, I think for a while a lot of the you know, a lot of the cool hip developers who, you know, were copy paste practitioners, you know, were, were doing Rails development, right? And then for a while they all switched to the iPhone because, hey, that was the, the new hotness. Um, but now a lot of them are switching to Android and so we're seeing a lot more of this. So um, just because it's, it's mobile, it's a, it's a small, you know, runs on a small device does not mean you can just throw code out there and expect it to work perfectly. Right. Um, so here's this guy. He's you know, written his own th thread framework, parsers and toolkits. Right. Um, and what happens to this guy? The same thing. Right. Is you know you have a lot of developers also who you know maybe they come from a different kind of background. You know, Android is is Java based. Maybe they've been doing like enterprise Java development. You know, they come to Android and they want to rewrite everything themselves. Right. You know, what, whatever's there, they don't even bother to learn what's there. They, they know how to do it better than, than the guys at Google do anyways, right? So they write all their own stuff, and it just becomes a big heaping mess of code they have to deal with that, you know, can often break pretty often too. Right, so, um, so testing, right? So, you know, you, you think, um, what's, what's, uh, what's testing on your, testing your app involve, right? Um, I love that our the previous speaker talked about unit testing because a lot of folks don't test their apps at all, right? They run it on their phone. They say, oh, hey, it's great. 
okay, submit to the Android market, ready to go, right? So, you know, uh, again, just because, you know, it's a mobile, it's a mobile app does not mean you don't have to test it, right? It's like, you know, all these lessons we've learned in software engineering over the years should not be suddenly forgotten because now we're do doing things for mobile devices, right? Um, so another thing I hear a lot about is uh, fragmentation, right? That's a real popular thing in a, the Android world is to complain about fragmentation. People think, oh my God, there's, you know, 350 different Android devices for sale out there currently. I need to, I have to test on all these different devices. But it's really not a very fair statement, right? If you actually, um, you know, slice things up in some reasonable way, like let's say screen size, right, or what types of screens you have to deal with. There's really only two that get you 95% of the market right there, right? So if you're not familiar with Android, you know, they um, categorize devices by the size, inches, and the pixel density, right? There's really only two variations that are very popular at all. So if you've tested on those two variations, you're in pretty good shape. It, just to compare on the, the iPhone side, you have everything's the same size, but you, again, you have to deal with two different pixel densities, right? So you wind up with basically two variations as well, right? Does it have a retina display or not? Um, so really not any difference. So I, I don't want to hear you bitch about it. Um, yeah, so I mentioned earlier about people, you know, um, moving to Android and not really thinking about, you know, the... Uh, you know, what's involved with Android programming, right? So here's a guy thinking he's going to make his app really fast by, you know, putting all the bitmaps, all the images into a hash map to, to cache them, right? Um, and what's going to happen there, right, is um, his app's going to freeze up, right? So again, there's a lot of developers who don't realize, okay, I'm developing for a mobile device. There are certain constraints I need to deal with, right? One of the big constraints on Android especially is memory. You know, um, every Android app gets capped out at a certain amount of memory, um, usually between 12 and 20 megabytes total, right? That's all you've got. So, you know, make sure you understand the constraints of the environment you're in. It's, it's not like writing Java for a server. We had a few things here. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, as far as what Michael was saying about engineering, um, I do sometimes feel like in the mobile world, we're in somewhat of a time-space continuum where all the lessons that we've learned about software engineering over the last 50 or 60 years just sort of vaporized. And people think that just because we're on a small device with, with a kind of a limited set, you know, hey, we don't really need to worry about this kind of stuff. You know, all this unit testing is just kind of out the door. And all the lessons that we've learned in the past building these large-scale systems that we've sort of developed over the years just kind of get thrown away. So testing is really important. Um, as far as testing goes, another thing is there's, there's different strategies for testing and all of them need to be employed. So it's not really just testing on your phone and other people's phones, which is extremely important. But, you know, automated testing is extremely important. Um, then there's also dealing with the specific devices. So as much as the screen size thing isn't important, we did talk a little bit earlier about the differences between the contact list on the HTC Sense and the Moto Blur and all these different forks of Android. And those are important to test on. So, you know, there's different strategies for that. There's U-Test, which is a, um, an outsourced firm that actually, um, it's it's actually crowdsourced, so you can actually you can get your uh, app tested on actual specific devices by real users and get reports sent back to you. Um, there's a company around here, Device Anywhere, where you can do remote testing on physical devices. So there's different strategies you can use, and all of them should be used. Um, and uh, you know, again, like Michael was saying, there's just specific things about Android as far as the tools that are available. They should all be used, and we should just build good software. I, I, I we can't say this enough. Just build good apps. Yeah, okay, so harsh on the developers a bit, right? You know, hope everybody uh, understands why, doesn't take it too personally. But now here's a more popular target, target right? The, the business guys or product managers. Let's, let's make fun of them, right? Um, By the way, any, any, any of you guys here, we need to know who we're making fun of. <laughs> nice. All right, it's your turn. Yeah, so a lot of folks these days think like, okay, I've got – a mobile phone, I've got a smartphone. So that makes me qualified to be a product manager for a smartphone, right? I, I have a smartphone, so I know what smartphone users want, you know? And so all they think about when coming up with requirements for an application is what they want out of it, right? So, you know, don't be that guy.
yeah, th th this is a little bit of a s just talking about feature sets. So again, we need to remember that mobile devices are constrained devices, both in size and functionality and just form factor. So this is just a, a quick comic about um, from a byte comic that I really like, just talking about the number of um, things on these handlebar, which is, is actually, I think, a nice metaphor for mobile devices, because you've got a very small um, place that you can put all this different functionality. And you really need to make sure that the functionality that's on the mobile device is specific for the task that the user is trying to do. Anything else is really just taking away, and instead of adding any benefit, actually just becomes a huge negative. So if you have all these bells and whistles in your mobile apps, you're just actually confusing your users and making it a little less useful as an app. Um, this is a real world example of you know, what happens when this goes awry. It doesn't help you ride this bike at all. Now, the next thing I kind of want to talk about is you know, there's a culture around all of this type of development. So when I was developing um, large-scale enterprise trading systems on Wall Street back in the day, um, there's a certain culture around those types of systems. You know, very few users, um, lots of money, serious risk, heavy testing. Um, at the same time, getting a release out was just impossible. So now that we're in the Android world and I'm working around all these different startups, of which we both work for startups, right? Um, there's this really intense need to push releases out all the time. So I used to work in a place called Rocket Space, which is a shared, um, it's a shared office space where when you don't have enough money as a startup to get your own office, you kind of rent by the desk by the month. And I actually saw something that looked just like this downstairs. So this is like exactly the problem with the culture of mobile development. And it's actually, I'd say, worse on Android. Um, a number of companies that I have worked with or around, I've heard things like, well, you know, since I don't really have to deal with the app review process, I'm more willing to put out a buggy Android build because I know I can fix it really quickly. That's a real problem. And that's something that we just need to get away from. Yeah, what was the quote about if, uh, if you don't have bugs, you're not releasing fast enough or something, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> um, yeah, so just in, in summary, right? Um, you know, apps are built for your, our users. They're not built for you, right? I, I don't care who you are, you know, if um, you can't just think about your own needs. This applies to designers and to developers, um, you know, executives, CEOs, founders, investors, right? Think about the people who are actually going to use your app first. Don't just think about how you would use it. You know, if one of your, uh, one of your use cases is posting to three Tumblr blogs, you built the app for you, not for real people, right? Um, keep the app concise and focused. You know, don't try to throw every feature you can think of in there just because you can do it. You know, and then the, the last thing is not like a supposition here. It's a fact, right, that an app's quality will reflect the time and money spent on the app. So when I was in college, we had to read a book called The Mythical Man Month. And if you've, you know, if you're an engineer, maybe you've read it, but if you're someone who works with software but you're not an engineer, you really should read it. You know, because it's it's all about like, you know, what's involved in building software. You know, it's not like, because of the building metaphor, you might think, oh, okay, I can just put more people on things and expect to get things done, um, like you would a construction project or something, but it doesn't work that way, right? So people need to understand like what's really involved in, in building software and what the constraints are. Yeah, and just to, add, uh, one, just to add one thing here, I mean, again, getting at the whole difference between this, this sort of time-space continuum I was talking about, I have literally worked with the same people on these large enterprise systems and now mobile systems, and for some reason, as soon as we got to the mobile space, they forgot about this fact that they knew this golden triangle about development quality and time. And all of a sudden now, since we're building mobile apps, I work with these guys who are just like, well, it's you, we can just crank this out in two weeks. And well, the answer is you can crank something out in two weeks, but the quality is obviously gonna go down that's fine. Somehow we understood this when we were building enterprise apps, but we don't understand this when we're building mobile apps. So there's definitely something a little bit missing here. Um, now, just to show you a little bit about where this is going, we're, we're kind of done um, talking about, you know, our biz dev folks now. This is, um, this is a post from uh, Andrew Main um, that I saw on Google Plus yesterday through a couple of friends of mine. Um, and there's some really radical suggestions here. He wrote this post talking about kind of Occupy Android uh, based on the Occupy Wall Street movement. I think that's a little bit extreme, but it did get a lot of people's attention, which I think is actually good. Um, but here are some suggestions that, that he had made. And I think the, 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 the extremeness of these suggestions, um, I think, makes, 
basically, I think it really points to the gravity of the issues that we're bringing up here. So the, the types of issues that we're talking about from a, from a business standpoint and also from an engineering quality standpoint, what Google needs to do and what the device manufacturers need to do, these aren't like bug fixes. These aren't little things that just need to get fixed in the next minor release of Android or even the next major release of Android. This isn't even something Google itself can control completely, right? I mean, this is something that all of us are involved in. It's a big, it's almost like a collaborative, you know, movement that we're working with on Android. Everybody needs to be involved. The device manufacturers have to improve their work. The carriers need to work with the device manufacturers to make sure that the, you know, latest Android OSs are out. It really is all of us. And I think that, that again, the, the, the extremeness of, of, you know, possibly forking out Android into a new company or, you know, a, an open source Firefox type situation, I, I do think reflect just how important it is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, we, uh, we're we certainly here complaining about things that bother us, but um, kind of the point is, is, is to show that it's not just us who's bothered by all these things. There's a lot of other folks, too, who think, think that there are some real big problems with the Android community, you know, and maybe something really extreme like these kind of proposals is what would be required to fix some of the issues. So um, hopefully we can uh, get a lot of these things fixed without something quite as extreme as some of these proposals. So that's kind of the end of our talk. Um, so we've shared with you some of our, you know, complaints and stories. But you know, we'd sort of like to hear from you guys. Um, you know, if you want to talk right now, um, or come up to us later, or email us, you know, please uh, share with us your pain and what you what you want changed. Yeah.